Okay, so are we ready to go? Okay, so this is the cloud and virtualization panel. Um, we have a few storage folks here too, so we're going to, you know, if we go into the weeds into storage with virtualization cloud, don't be surprised. Um, but uh, yeah, let's get this party started. So um, I'm just going to kick it off with a question and then we'd love for the audience to just jump in and uh, work on this conversation with us. Excuse me? Yes. Definitely. Yeah, we're going to do that. So uh, why don't we start with you introducing you yourself. yourself. Oh, that would be a good idea. I'll introduce myself first. So I am Leah Shob. Uh, I work at the uh, evaluator group as a technical analyst. Um, Ex-VMware. I worked at VMware. I left uh, about two years ago. Um, and uh, so I'm here today as your moderator talking about cloud and virtualization. And I'm Stephen Foskett. I organize Tech Field Day, and I used to have a job where I worked with storage. <laughs> All right. Stu Miniman. I'm an analyst at Wikibon. I cover networking, virtualization, and cloud. Uh, I worked at EMC for 10 years when we were launching some of the hybrid cloud stuff and uh, worked with VMware since like 02. Cool. I'm Hugo Fan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hugo Fan. Uh, currently work at Atlantis Computing, uh, X Canopy, who uh, is a cloud company and uh, also ex VMware when we first started doing vCloud Director. Cool. Aaron Delp, uh, Cloud Solutions Architect at SolidFire. I do CloudStack, OpenStack, and VMware solutions. And prior to that, uh, was at Citrix doing CloudStack and um, large VCE coalition VMware stuff <laughs> <laughs> prior to that and a reseller uh, before that. Sean? Hi, Sean Clark. I'm a cloud architect, um, mercenary. I'm on my second company. Uh, so I fly in to help people figure out cloud and, and uh, get disillusioned with the fact that it really is something and there's some technical pieces there. Um, I'm one of the VM Underground OGs, but this year I'm taking a sabbatical. So um, Brian and Jim and their partnership with V Brown Bag, I'm really proud of this love child that kind of came out of the two. It's awesome. Very cool. Great. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I was going to ask a trending question that that uh, viewers had uh, recently uh, asked a question about, which is, what are the top one or two virtualization trends you guys are going to see going into 2015? Um, you know, we've we've kind of played out software defined X and mm. and the term cloud. Um, so we we're going to have to move on to some new marketing terms. And um, do you foresee what kind of technology are we going to build on in order to um, get these new terms? Well, it's got to be containers. I mean, come on. Oh, there you go. <laughs> right there. Yeah. Ding. Drink. <laughs> yep. Drink. <laughs> yeah. and, and isn't that an old phrase as yeah. well as a new phrase? I mean, you know, I worked at Sun Microsystems. We talked about containers a lot. Uh, Solaris containers. Come yes. on, yeah. it, it's, But it was containers. But, but here's the thing. Cause, cause, you know, just just to beat on the Docker drum for a minute here, uh, you know, what, what virtualization really gave us, it allowed IT to really move from kind of the, the you know, sheet metal to the VM, which, which gave me a lot of functionality. And what containers and Docker are going to allow us to do is really focus on the application, which I'm an infrastructure guy, and we all know the only reason you have infrastructure is to support those applications. So, you know, that, I'm that really is not sure all infrastructure people know that. Well, they should. They, they might will. come as a surprise <laughs> to some people. Yeah. Okay. It's, coming, it's coming in this yeah. beam mode as well. Absolutely. But for, for the biggest trend, I, you know, when I sat here listening to the network panel and listening to the other panel, it, it's really about kind of that automation and orchestration, uh, really helping as we get, you know, you know bigger environments and, uh, you know, just s things moving much faster. Um, we need to be able to have some intelligence in there because, you know, the poor admin's not going to be able to keep up with uh, some of the old manual processes that we had there. But you think those same admins would both manage the traditional x86 virtualization stack and also the Docker stack as well? Um, so, you know, sit, sitting listening to the last panel, my question is, you know, you're going to have your applications live many places. That's right. So, you know, VMware's not going anywhere anytime soon, you know, they're not going away, I should say, uh, anytime soon. Um, you know, cloud and its various, yeah. you know, models, are, you know, are, are growing there. So, um, you know, the, the IT staff is kind of managing that portfolio. Um, and, and absolutely, I see huge growth for the virtualization admin to kind of, you know, grow into the cloud space and, and yeah. management many I more guess pieces. From, from the 
previous panels when we listened in previously, they were talking about virtualizing, uh, virtualization admins covering different skill sets, both storage, networking, infrastructure, and now this new thing, com new thing comes along, which is a container, i.e. Docker or mm -hmm. cloud volumes, for example. These are some of the skills I think that every single virtualization admin would need to start learning, right? Not just you know today with all the automation pieces that they need to learn, VCAC, VCO, and so on. There's these other skills which I don't think um, a single function can handle all of these different skill sets. So there will be more and more requirements on you know an IT department to cover all the bases. So having more of a of a uh, team than just a VI admin person. Sure. Yeah. 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 Specializing in different areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. The, the the containerization of IT seems to me to be very. Um, very different from virtualization, you know, fundamentally, strategically, I mean, just conceptually what you're doing is so different. You know, I mean, when you're talking about uh, server virtualization in the way that we've used uh, VMware vSphere traditionally, it's been about um, applications that are smaller than a server. And when you talk about uh, containers and real cloud, it's about applications that are bigger than a server. And to me, I think that that really is a fundamental difference between these things. And I think it goes to what you're saying in terms of who's running these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's just a, such a different thing. And you know, you guys have actually been building this stuff. What do you What do you think? Well, I'm actually going to take it in a slightly different direction, though, when it comes to like the trends. I'm actually going to say a very unsexy trend that I think needs to happen because I, you know, in the analyst terms, we're almost kind of going into that trough of disillusionment with, with cloud right now. And a lot of it really comes around the operations standpoint of it because everyone has been really trying to figure out how to get cloud up and running and everyone's mm. kind of starting to finally wrap their head around the fact that it's pretty freaking complex to manage sometimes, right? And, and if you do get it up and running, are you ever gonna upgrade it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you ever going to, you know, how, do, how does this get easier to operate over time? And that's the biggest thing I'm seeing in a lot of our customers where not only is it, you know, do you get up and, up and running, but what do you do with it in six months, 12 months? And you're starting to see some trends, especially in the OpenStack community, of managed OpenStack. You know, yeah. companies like Platform9, MetaCloud, Bluebox, uh, you know, Mirantis with their, their hybrid cloud offering. You're starting to see trends because you know some OpenStack customers just threw up their hands. We're like, no, this is this is too freaking hard to manage. I'm just going to go outsource that. Well, Aaron, right. if I can hop in on that, and, I, and I'd love to hear what Sean's seeing in the field yeah, on this. But say, it, one of the big differences I also see is virtualization. You put something in a VM, and boy, you're never going to change it for the most part. It seems. I mean, I remember 10 years ago, it was you know let's throw Windows NT in there because <laughs> I can then extend the life cycle of that application for a long time. Let's put DOS and, in and there. It, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it made me cringe. And you look at um, you know some of the things building around the, the Docker community like CoreOS. It's let's have an operating system that is just always up to date. Uh, let's have applications that are going to be not worrying about what that infrastructure is underneath it and it can change. And whether today is sitting on Linux or VMware and tomorrow is sitting on Amazon or Google, mm -hmm. it, it, it's going to move. So, so it, I mean, this is this is a little bit further out there. Some of it, right. but that's please. a great segue into where my mind has been around containers for a while. And like when virtualization came up, it's like, wow, look at this. This is so cool. And then you go to throw it out there, and then, nope, can't run Oracle on it. Can't run big box software yeah. on it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, great. Then eventually they kind of come around, right? And then, oh, cloud. Great. Let's do cloud. I'm going to do VCA, CV, cloud director. I'm going to do cloud and blah, blah, blah. App doesn't work on it. Why? It needs to run on AIX. It needs to run on U UX. There's a back end on a physical server somewhere. You get really disillusioned, right? So Docker, again, really cool, but what can you actually move there on the, on the app side, right? Um, it, it, and to Stephen's point, it's something bigger than a server that seems to be the target for it. Web scale computing, maybe a new platform as a service development platform, right? Mm -hmm. Which is greenfield, brand new from the ground up, right? You're going to have a hard time taking your snowflake, one-off unicorn apps that come off the shelf with your little, you know, customizations on it and expect it to run in a container. Yeah. Um, so that's, I guess that's the biggest thing, uh, going back to education yeah. too, as admins and practitioners, we need to be aware of this so that when um, CIO or whoever comes in and says, we're going to containerize all the things, and we're like, well, you know let's coming. do some education, because I would like to, but it you know, you got to go green field. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's the most common question that I get. I do seminars on storage and virtualization and so on. By far, the number one question that I get is, it just frustrates me so much, is, 
Um, my CIO said we have to go all cloud. Can I do that? And I'm just like, well, you could. Um, does that make sense? You know, do your apps run in this cloud that you're going to? You know, I mean, it's 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 just this 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 vision thing, right? And um, you know, I, I, I'm a believer that IT is, is going to continue parallel to how it's always been. I mean, we still have mainframes, and we still have minis, and, uh, you know, we still have DOS. We still have tandems. We still have, you know, all these other things in there. You know, yes, we even still have AIX and HPUX, and, mm -hmm. and we're not going to get rid of that anytime soon, no. you know? Yeah. But I, th I do believe that the next generation applications are going to be these cloud platform applications, and they, those applications are just going to eat this um, containerized you know, environment up. Right. I think it's a great platform for the next generation application. Yeah, and these next generation applications, um, you know, they're, they're easier to program with, it's rapid deployment. There's a whole new world um, mm. out there in how um, programmers develop software these days, you know, we're the, the, the days of C++ and, um, you know, other operating, uh, uh, other um, programming languages that we've worked with, um, you know, they're kind of taking a little bit of a back seat to some of these new yeah, that's um, programming totally, that's totally languages. Passe. I mean, yeah. today's, um, I mean, and it is, it's next generation applications. It's not this generation. Mm -hmm. But if you ask, like, the, the, the enterprise developers, the people who wrote all the Windows apps that everybody's using in their data center, uh, those developers aren't writing to Win32 or POSIX, and they're not writing in C or C++. They're writing, you know, C Sharp for Azure, and they're writing, you know, mm -hmm. yes, Java. You know, I mean, they're, 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 <laughs> yeah, Java's still they're moving using. forward and, and leaving a lot of what we IT people love behind. I think that's, that's the difference, right? Um, I don't think any developer would like to write in a, those old languages. They want to play with new stuff, play with new technology. But unfortunately, the business dictates their needs based on the application needs. And therefore, that application needs a certain uh, infrastructure, architecture in the back end. Um, so I'll give an example. At, at, when I was at Canopy, we, we had a great relationship with Pivotal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, did a lot of work with Cloud Foundry. Mm -hmm. and Pivotal and Greenplum and so on. So those are the kind of applications, sorry, infrastructure where you can run large scale applications without really worrying about the underlying infrastructure. Right. So that's the difference between the traditional applications today, for example, your business processes, your Oracle applications and so on. Those things, you're never going to run in a cloud, right? You're going to yeah. need your traditional infrastructure. And one thing that, um, that I noticed that uh, a lot of vendors are still finding is that they, they need some of those foundation languages um, still there. They, they go to universities to um, you know, hire the next generation of engineers and programmers. And, and they're not learning C they're, anymore. They're, no, no. they're certainly not learning COBOL. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're learning. You know, they they yeah. want push, pop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so the, their, their language is very limited. And they don't have those foundations. So um, I was talking to the CTO of, of NetApp. And he said it's a hard, really hard to find um, you know, that next generation of programmers that know those foundation languages. Um, and so they're, they're running into this quandary because they need both. So it's kind of interesting. So well, quick, quick poll of the audience here. Who has what they would consider a cloud, either in-house or under your operations or anything like that? Cool. So, yeah. Come on, you can raise Greg? it higher than yeah. that. <laughs> All right. Give an example, All right. Greg. And, and so for those that didn't raise their hand, is there like thinking about it, been told you need to think about it? Like what's the feelings around cloud computing from y'all? Yeah. Or, or have you checked to make sure that one of the groups in your company isn't already running on Amazon and you just don't know about it? <laughs> right. You know, so. Yeah, so like, for instance, tell, tell us a little bit about yours real quick. Uh, so the one I'm directly involved with uh, is a private cloud running uh, HP suite, okay. uh, CSA, cloud service automation, yep. uh, using uh, HP operations for orchestration as yep. the um, automation engine. Uh, there is quite a proliferation of shadow IT of mm. other groups uh, mm -hmm. that have uh, AWS footprints that, uh, of course, never went through the infrastructure uh, department. Right. Just spun up what they thought they wanted, and they don't care about care feeding long-term supportability. It's just I dump workloads there when I want to process, and that's the example right. I think. Yeah, so quick for the recording, it, it's basically the HP cloud software, but 
there is, quite frankly, some AWS in the house that gets mm. crushed like little bugs every once in a while, right? Like that always seems to happen. But, but so real quick, I mean, questions for us. What, what's really pressing on your minds right now of like, is a lot of it just hype? Is there any trends and directions or problems that anybody is seeing when they're trying to implement them? Like, throw some questions here. Come on. I know you've got one. Hmm. And trying to find that right balance of mix to integrate all of these different things, both now and as right. you look towards things like containers. Yeah. So, do you so want to repeat for recording? Because <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to repeat for recording, right? Yeah. I'm following Yes, it. all right, okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take it over, moderator. Oh, okay. Uh, you were doing such a great job. No, 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 no. <laughs> So I I forgot half the, what you said because <laughs> um, you know about accessibility in the cloud. You guys see that as being a big concern. Mm -hmm. how, how so you mean it? integration or, or yeah. I mean what do you mean by extensibility? Well, it's just, it's like, so you take it. I got it. <laughs> Let's talk real quick about VMware's flagship cloud product going forward, right? The VCAC, right? Um, and right now, if you want to extend VCAC, you have to go the VCO route, right? Um, if you want to do Linux, you could choose a plethora of things that you could do to orchestrate the Linux, right? Puppet, Chef, whatever. Um, but you got to get it information from VCAC. If you want to do Windows, I'm sure you could do Puppet. I'd love to see one you know, configuration management to rule them all, but you're probably going to do SCCM or something like that, right? <laughs> so now you got PowerShell and Scorch being called from VCO and JavaScript on the inside, because if you want to do anything, you got to do JavaScript. Mm -hmm. On the Puppet side, it could be, you know, pure Puppet. You could be hacking it with Ruby. Um, you know, there's lots of different tools. And there was an automation um, brown bag uh, panel earlier this, this morning that was great. Um, they didn't really tie into this, but there's a lot of horses for courses, but more likely it's like horses for silos, right? And it, it really just depends on your silo and what you're feeding your horse. Yeah. I'm stretching this and it sounds like it's a, it's a lot of different tools, and <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you can really choose to be, you know, great at all of them, right? Yeah, and it sounds like it sounds like your silos move, you know, from traditional IT where your silos were. Um, considered more um, on the hardware side, it sounds like those silos are now, um, because of choices in what you make to implement mm. those environments, it sounds like those silos are changing a little bit. So uh, have any of you guys run into issues around that on the development side? Can I ask a sure, go ahead. So Re repeat it quick, and then you take a shot, and then I'll take a shot at it. Will there too. be one cloud to rule them all? Is the question, right? My um, precious. Right. <laughs> so, like when storage area networks first came on the scene, I think that was the pipe dream we all had too. Is there'll be one storage to rule them all, right? Yeah. One centralized thing. Yeah, and remember that? In, <laughs> and, and not only that, it was supposed to go outside of companies. It was supposed to be yeah. like a metro thing, and, <laughs> and there would be people with some storage on this yeah. big yeah. network. It's yeah. awesome. But how many people have a single storage vendor? Maybe a vendor, but single storage technology, right? You, you don't. You have everything. Um, I think cloud is going to be similar. You're yeah. going to. Mm -hmm. I was going to add to that. Aren't gonna let yeah. you have just one so, cloud. so, and I, first of all, no, I don't think there will be one cloud to rule them all because it all will be workload based and application based, and there is no true cloud that really supports all the different application types from legacy all the way to web scale or whatever you want to call microservices, you know, Docker or whatever. But what's what's interesting here is if you think about it too, that over the years, some terms very subtly changed in the cloud industry. 
Um, years ago, hybrid cloud w was something we used to call bursting. <laughs> and, <laughs> and everyone was like, oh, you're going to burst. You're going to you know, own the base uh, and rent the spike. And everything's going to magically go from here to go there. And it, it never happened because the technology wasn't there to do it. Um, oh, nice. Uh, things like data gravity, you know, how are you going to get the data from here to there in a timely fashion? It never happened, right? So hybrid cloud, instead of going away in that definition, hybrid cloud actually morphed into a new definition very subtly over time of, well, hybrid cloud is really just some cloud over here and some cloud over there, you know, here cloud, there cloud kind of thing, right? And well, that is effectively, your answer was no, right? Hybrid cloud is just multi-cloud. They're just calling it hybrid cloud. <laughs> so that, that's kind of been the accepted term in the industry of where hybrid cloud has gone. Yeah, to, just to mm -hmm. build on that, Aaron, you know, you, so many people say, oh, I'm going to move to the cloud. But it, it, it's such a broad portfolio. If you talk to almost any company out there, do you have SaaS? It's like, yeah, sure, of course. You're using Salesforce. You're using lots of other tools out there. Um, you know, are, are you, do you have something inside? Well, everybody here has something inside the house, and you're looking at various services outside and, and there are some that I want to be able to orchestrate and you know be able to do some things with it but it's it usually you're, you're choosing that portfolio um, we, we talked to CIO of a pretty pretty large healthcare organization um, who said you know I just want to buy something if it's you know completely agile which means that I can you know burst up pay by the drink and everything like that and 85% of what I do in-house is undifferentiable didn't mean that he's killing his data center of course, he'd like to kill as much of his data center as he could. Heck, you know, from our surveys, um, we only find a couple of companies that want data centers, and they're actually real estate investment companies. Not even Amazon <laughs> wants to buy data centers anymore. That's Unless you're, you know, uh, the, the super nap in Vegas and stuff, or, you know, Equinix, those are the only guys that want to own the data center. Those guys love the data center. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Um, but, you know, outside of that, you know, it's where do I do things? And that company, he said, you know, he went to like Oracle and SAP and said, you need to deliver this to me. And some of the big software companies said, well, I can't do this. He said, great, I'll go to Canopy or Atos or uh, you know, Amazon to buy those services. And you know, they build themselves their own portfolio. You know, we're seeing a lot of the big companies are trying to build enterprise you know, uh, marketplaces. I mean, AWS, of course, has a marketplace. IBM has a marketplace. EMC has a marketplace. Um, and you know, a lot of the vendors here at VMworld are helping to either enable building a marketplace or they're going to be a SaaS application, you know, inside of them. So, you know, there is no the cloud. It's, it's just, you know, I, I think it's kind of like, you know, the internet just became what it is. The cloud is just becoming, you know, what, what's there. Well, it, it's, it's going to be like horses for courses, right? I mean, the application will drive what the application is running on. And too, too often, I mean, back to our discussion of, you know, we're moving to the cloud and things like that. Uh, too often, I think people, um, you know, they put the cart before, the, oh man, I'm getting a lot of horse metaphors yeah, in here. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, <laughs> the, the, the silos, oats, okay. They put the cart before the horse, right? And they think, you know, it's all about the infrastructure. But it's not. As, as you know, as you were saying, it's really all about the application. Some applications want to run on a mainframe. Some applications want to run on VMware, on you know, Windows or Linux or whatever. Some applications really want to run on a certain cloud, one, one or the other depending on you know, what they were written for. And so I think most companies are, for, for example, I think most companies in another year or two are gonna have um, Azure uh, with applications that are intending to run on Azure because yeah. that's the kind of things that CIOs go and buy or CFOs or sales or whatever. You know, they, they wanna buy some application that runs on a Microsoft Azure environment, so they're gonna, they're gonna use that. Some, Applications are going to run on, you know, maybe Hadoop or maybe OpenStack or maybe whatever. It's it's just whatever, uh, whatever platform that application is intended to run on is what you're going to buy. And so, you're not going to have a cloud. You're going to have some clouds, and that's just how it's going to be. Just like today, you don't have a server, you know, or a operating system. I mean, why do we still use NT4? Because I guess that's what some crummy old application wants to run on. So there's it, that. It runs yeah. the airline terminal departure boards and the ATMs. Mm. Yeah, stuff. now those are XP. <laughs> yeah, come on, come on. Yeah. And I think that that's what fosters a lot of, and I think there's too many of them, of these um, uh, cloud standard scripts to be able to give um, 
admins the ability to federate between all of these clouds that they're putting together and allow them to communicate knowing that they're going to be drastically different. And I think a lot of these guys are forward thinking in that area, but um, I don't know how many folks out here that have tried to use CDMI or some of these other standards interfaces in order to um, federate uh, multiple clouds. I, I respect See? these guys come, trying to come up with a standard oh, yeah. for the cloud, but I, I just feel like it's too early. Yeah. I mean, for the what, you know? I mean, it's... Well, it's, it's not too early to develop, but it's, it's probably too early for it to, to be used in a production type of environment. I find some of them are because they're lacking um, in certain areas. So that's why I wanted to, to find out if anybody was actually using some of these standard interfaces because this, this kind of shows that, yeah, it is a little early. And um, so, as, as far as that's concerned. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, sorry, talking about standards, you're talking about multiple clouds. Now, I'm a consultant. The, the, the challenge for that is you've got multiple clouds, multiple solutions, forces for courses, et cetera. But as a consultant, I'm the person that they ask to make everything integrate together. And that's where I think for customers, and it's a real challenge, is trying to get the cloud air to If you don't mind, I'll, I'll take first crack. Yeah, go ahead. So, so repeat the question. I'm going to super paraphrase it down is, will there be standards and does it make sense? Right? Is that fair? Yeah. And uh, will there be standards? Honestly, probably not. Um, the reason why is nine times out of ten, it's not in their best interest to, to get completely, you know, tinfoil hat, evil schemes for a second. It's not in their best interest a lot of times to have complete compatibility and move workloads from Amazon to Azure to any of these others, right? They, you know, they want everything to be the Roach Motel of everything goes in and nothing ever goes out. And that's just unfortunately the ugly business side of cloud computing. But if you were to remove that for a second and actually throw in the technical side of it, well, where is that common, owl, common layer that has to happen, right? It's probably at the API, right? It is probably a common API that has to exist across all of these platforms to be able to move workloads or commands that will actually federate. Mm -hmm. Well, again, good luck with that, right? And so, unfortunately, it is more of just, the, it, it, it is in the best interest of the customer for that to happen. It isn't necessarily in the best interests of the vendors for that for that to happen, and it's the unfortunate truth. So the, the way I look at it. So the takeaway here is, if you're not in uh, cloud integration consulting, it's a really hot job market right now. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody need a new career? <laughs> yeah, Aaron, just just to build on that, I mean, if I look at the big cloud players, you know, uh, they're consumers of open source, but they're not really active open. contributors to that as opposed to OpenStack. Um, yep. You know, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any comments on that. Yeah, the, there is definitely, so, you know, you take, I'll take the poster child of it first, Red Hat, right? Red Hat is probably leading the charge the most when it comes to actually, you know, playing nicely, developing in, in you know, taking OpenStack for a second. So I'm going to, you know, completely OpenStack. You know, developing in trunk and develop, you know, taking everything, donating it back to trunk and pulling everything down and kind of really being good shepherds in the, in the open source community. Um, there are others doing it to certain extents, but there is, you know, honestly, I'm not going to name names, there's a lot of startups that quite frankly pull trunk, make a bunch of modifications and never give it back because that is their secret sauce and they have no plans to ever give it back. That's true. Um, or they, you know, what, again, OpenStack community, what they're looking to really do is encourage everyone to, okay, this is a differentiating feature. Uh, yeah, I'm going to keep that code private, but the code that actually is the betterment of the common platform, you know, maybe APIs or something like that, for instance, yes, that absolutely 
if they're you know actually trying to actively pressure, quite frankly, the foundation the foundation members to donate all of that code back and to have a, a better interaction between mm -hmm. all the vendors. Yeah, that would be nice. And let's and let's and not forget how standards happen. I mean, it really, if you look backwards at standards that are successful, that, that we actually continue to use, things like SCSI and USB and, T10. you know, <laughs> x86, um, you know, what usually happens is, is the groups get together with this grand goal of creating the ultimate thing and they spin their wheels and create some big bad ultimate thing and then eventually the market decides well we really like this little core section of it here and we're never going to implement the rest of it and we're never going to use the rest of it and we're going to extend all around it like you were saying with you know embrace and extend right but they usually what happens is they'll embrace a bit of the standard and then extend all around it it'll still be somewhat compatible but somewhat incompatible and you end up with a situation, again, I'm a storage guy, so I, I, I look at like, you know, SCSI and things, you know, you end up with a situation where there is interoperability and there is really something of a standard, but there's not a, a be all, end all, do all, interoperable standard. It's, yeah. it's, it's just these, you know, a, a small pathway that we can function on, but if you want the real good stuff, then you got to use our special secret ingredients as yeah. well. And that's how they differentiate yeah. themselves on the market. And that's really not bad. And I imagine that's probably where cloud is going to go too. You know, we'll probably have standards for, you know, different different components, different parts of the of the cloud stack, not cloud stack, but the, the cloud yeah. stack that, that do interoperate between different clouds. But it won't be everything. And it won't be this vision of portability where you're going to be able to just move your workloads magically from this cloud to that cloud. Yeah, because I, I, I notice in um, a lot of the, the, the standards for this today, um, there's less sharing than there was years ago with the storage standards and the server standards. Um, you know, there's less sharing, there's less going through ISO for, um, you know, for acceptance and that kind of stuff. So um, we may get to a core that everybody can politely communicate with, but we'll always see that pr proprietary secret sauce. I think it's yeah. always going to be like there. I'd like to ask one thing. Um, before we get to that one cloud API integration to rule them all, <laughs> if VMware could do it first, that would be you know, they, they just sit, for their products. They sit on a lot of the committees, but I don't, <laughs> no, I don't just, see just them. For their just for their products. Yeah, but I don't see them <laughs> about moving it forward. Yeah, I don't see them sharing and really moving it forward, yeah. but I do see them you know, contributing in small ways. I'll so think, you had sorry. a question right nope. here. So to sum up, do we really need another platform when we're never going to get rid of anything? <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's about. That's yeah. beautiful. Or should we just try to automate what we have and try to make the best of it? Okay. Since I summed up, you guys have to answer. Go. <laughs> How do you build your containers? So that I'm not a container expert, right? Mm. But don't you still have to create the first container, right, to your liking? So aren't wouldn't you have to use Puppet or Chef to create that, or am I way off base? Well, yeah. But just for the building piece, right?
Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to say that it's not a good idea, but if I can't get even a tenth of my apps in, into it, is it worth it? But that's the question, though. Do you want to get your the tenth of those apps into a container, or do you want to build new apps that live in this container world? So, you know, get rid of all the legacy stuff, still run it on your traditional infrastructure, but focus on your you know, agile development processes to run on a container instead. And, or think about it this way. Let me just have a little flashback here with my Doc Brown. Oh my God. Okay, ready? Um, <laughs> should we really be looking at this, this Linux operating system when we've just gotten AIX and HPUX and Solaris and, and we're moving forward with POSIX? Or should we focus really on trying to get, you know, POSIX working? Why should we adopt this new operating system, you know, we would say exactly the same thing back then. The answer is, does it serve a need? Mm -hmm. If Docker serves a need particularly well that applications eat up, then we're going to use it whether we want to or not. Well, and I, I may have a, a, you know, a quick blurb that may help with that. So quick shameless plug, I, I do a podcast on the side called The Cloudcast. And actually last week we had uh, Lucas Carlson, who is... Um, Chief Innovation Officer at um, CenturyLink, and he does Panamax, which is a graphical Docker, if you will. You know, it's Docker with a GUI front end. And, but he made a, a, a blurb in the podcast that was really good about, we, we kind of did the same of like, why Docker, right? Why containers? And, and his, his summary was very simple. He said, he said Docker does for DevOps what, um, uh, what's the website? Crap. GitHub does for developers. <laughs> it's as simple as that as far as like, it, it basically makes the workflows and the, the, uh, the agile infrastructure, if you will, aspects of DevOps that, that everyone wants and everyone's after mm -hmm. right now. It, it provides a lot of unique you know, aspects to it that you don't get from traditional VMs. And so the reason why everyone's so Docker, Docker, container, it's because the DevOps folks just love it, right? They, mm -hmm. they see it as a new tool in the toolbox that isn't a hammer. It's a screwdriver, and they've been looking for a screwdriver for years. And it's really immaterial what we think of it or what we want to do strategically, because if they want that, and if they're going to write around it and focus on it and build on it, we got it. What you think, Sean? You, you, got a, you got a deep, deep thought look on your face, man. What you think? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think if you don't have a mature platform infrastructure as a service offering, where you've gone out and developed VCAC integrated with Puppet, yep. or VCAC integrated with SCCM, or something, right? Then Docker looks great, because the developer comes out and goes, look, I can stand up a web server like this. And then if you didn't have that system and you're an infrastructure guy, you're backpedaling. Because, oh, I can get you a Windows, but that's it, <laughs> right? But if you have those integrations in your VCAC system, you can give them a web server. I can give you an Apache server, right? And we can integrate that with other things. But again, you had to roll your own, mm -hmm. and you had to invest in a configuration management system that you know, integrates with VCAC or OpenStack or whatever, right? Um, and quite honestly, I guess, that, you know, you have Pivotal and, and the Cloud Foundry stuff and other things like it coming out. If you're gonna be reinventing your apps, you know, why, why reinvent the, the paths, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. why, why not yeah. just code to that and then you get a huge leap forward and then that takes us into another world, right? Build your own paths or buy your own. Right. Fair. That's so, kind of part of what Pivotal is all about. Yeah. Um, I thought I saw a couple of hands go up. Yes. What are your opinions uh, and experiences around internal infrastructure groups, in essence, offering public cloud as a service internally, serving as kind of a gatekeeper towards public service, uh, service uh, public cloud service offerings? Good idea, bad idea, inherently opposing. Okay, so, uh, you know, I think he's saying, you know, what do you think, can, can I paraphrase you, say IT taking over the public cloud, you know, deployment internal? So, you know, I mean, we, we always thought for a couple of years, you know, the, the way to get rid of stealth IT is, of course, to embrace it. 
um, and, and it's tough. You know, I, I've worked for a lot of big corporations, and IT was always the company that told you no. Mm -hmm. And later. if IT, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But later, no later. No. Don't say no. Don't say no. That's a t-shirt. There yeah. yeah. is no. Yeah. 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 Anybody notice there's a lot of no signs around the VMworld show this year. It's, oh, it's yeah. Really, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No limits. No limits. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, absolutely, you know, you know, what is the role of the CIO going forward? Because if a large portion of, you know, IT isn't in-house, you know, are they, you know, managing a portfolio. So, the, you know, there, there's been a, you know, a lot of debate among us as to, you know, how much of it are they just, you know, a service buyer or coordinating yeah. it? Do they become a chief digital officer? Um, so, you know, we, we think absolutely, at least from, from my standpoint, um, you, you've got to, you know, look at embracing it because there are absolutely uses for lots of the, you know, public cloud. You know, you're all using, you know, some, most of you are using some kind of office stuff. You're doing Office 365 now. So you're on Azure already. Um, and you've, you've, most people have something in uh, Amazon and, you know, you, yeah. it, you're going to oh, yeah. be using it. So you don't want pockets. You want to, you know, try to, to at least, it. you know, manage I think that. I think that's the right approach. So, for example, if, you, if I was running an IT department, I would really want to be the broker of all these different services, whether that be I'm providing my own private cloud internally, or uh, if my developers want to use AWS, I don't want them to go directly to AWS. I want them to go through me as the broker. So I have, you know, I control the governance and I control the policies for that access. So having an IT department which embraces all these new things, right, Docker, containers, and so on, but being the governance layer for all these different technologies, and I think that's the key. Yeah. Right? If I could add, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Is that a model that you're seeing successfully implemented? Yeah, for, yeah and I was, for me personally, absolutely. I, what I see actually, it's interesting, because I think there's a misconception out there that, that everyone thinks, public cloud versus just straight up infrastructure versus private cloud, like you can actually just take any application or any workload, the use cases are all the same, it's just a matter of where it's hosted. And that's just flat out false. And I'll, here's an example. Um, so the, the very first AWS conference, so what, 2011 maybe, and I was at one of the parties having beers with this guy who ran infrastructure for a very, very large financial firm, one that I was shocked that they were there and they were using AWS. So I was like, all right, I got to figure out. So I bought him a beer and was like, all right, tell me your story. <laughs> and so he said, you know, what, what was really the most interesting thing was he said, you know, I can do things on, you know, AWS, but really insert public cloud here. That is impossible. And I said, okay, like, what are you doing? He said, we, and it's, again, well-known website, right? We basically take a copy of the website at any given time, clone it, if you will, into public cloud, run in the neighborhood of 10,000 nodes at any given time at scale, stress test it, do whatever we need to do, shut it off, delete it. Mm -hmm. He said it costs about eh, 20 to $25,000 per stress test. He said it cost me about 3.4 million to buy that infrastructure. Yeah. He said I can run a lot of stress tests. Mm. You know, there's things like that that, you know, there's some very unique use cases that public cloud has that, you know, some of the others don't, right? So, you know, it's, it's not always the same thing everywhere, just where it's hosted. I think yeah. that's a great use case for cloud, though, right? Mm -hmm. which oh, is stress, absolutely. Which is stress testing. Exactly. You don't want to do that in your internal infrastructure because yeah. you won't have enough infrastructure yeah. to run 10,000. Exactly. No, that's where no the 3.4 million or, yeah. dollars comes into play. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, and I just, if you yeah. do decide to do, um, you know, to, to have some governance over um, uh, offering public cloud offerings, one thing you have to make sure is that it is just a credit card away, just like AWS. So that, that's another thing that, um, that some companies had to realize internally is that they had to make it that easy and that simple. They couldn't just offer it. And there have been a few companies that have not only offered it to their employees, but they realized they've got a new, gener a new um, generation stream. So then they start creating something where they can offer to, you know, the public in the local area and things like that. But a lot of small businesses 
um, use that because they, they end up offering a, a lower cost. So it's, it's something to think about. Yeah. And just one, one note about the IT department, what I found is, is if you have a kind of a leading edge systems integrator, VAR consultants that you're working with, they're going to help you, you know, build that, you know, justify mm -hmm. the portfolio and, and, and offer the services. I mean, Amazon's going full bore after the same guy that was selling, you know, storage to you uh, for the last five years. So, you know, they know they need to get, uh, the, the public cloud needs to touch the enterprise, you know, much closer and get belly to belly there. So, so hopefully you're going to have more resources soon. Okay. Well, I just got the two-minute warning, and so it's time to kind of wrap things up a little bit. I'd just like to get last comments from each of you. You want to start? No. Some last comments? No? You want to have your last comments? Oh, you want the last word. He wants to back clean up our okay. third. Okay, okay, I'll other? start then. Okay. And then, then you can have the last word. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think people have to be people have to be reactive, basically. You have to have a strategy of embracing it, you know. I find myself, surprisingly enough, agreeing with Stu. Usually I don't, but, but this time I do. That, that frankly, um, you know, you, you've got a choice. You can either stand in the way or you can get on board. And I think that IT needs to get on board as, demand, as there's real demand. You know, I mean, you can't just like go willy-nilly and say, oh, this is the greatest thing ever and I'm going to add it to my service catalog and all that. But basically, if, if you start seeing people using you know, cloud platforms or using containers or using, you know, uh, automation, you've got to say, okay, this is clearly what they want, this is clearly the direction they're going in, and we're going to figure out a way to offer that within context of IT. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get bulldozed. Stu? Okay. Uh, thanks, Leah. Uh, and uh, it's been, been, been great talking to everybody here. Um, so, you know, one of the biggest things I see is, you know, we've, we've, over the last 10, 15 years, we, we've constantly been bemoaning the fact that we spend way too much, you know, number 70 to maybe 90% of our resources keeping the lights on. You know, all of us here, huge proponents of virtualization, didn't move the needle. So what is going to move that needle? How does IT help you know, create more value for the business is you know, looking, at, looking at these new models uh, and you know, being able to embrace uh, some of these things a little bit faster. Great. So what they said. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I think you two probably said it very, very well. So uh, just to add on those points, um, the key here is there's a lot of choice today with regards to the cloud providers that you can use. You can run your own clouds with VCAC or VCD or OpenStack internally, or you can consume these pre-ready-made clouds from lots of companies, AWS, Rackspace, who have now pulled out of cloud, interestingly. Um, but to, to provide all the services which you know, your internal developers or your internal application owners require, it's all about the governance and how you control that governance, how you control access to those things to, to one, prevent shadow IT, and also make the most of whatever you know, investment you have from not just keeping the lights on, but also enabling um, you know, agile development, enabling innovation in your organizations as well. I'm going to build on that slightly and <laughs> do the, do, yes, there are a lot of choices out there, but when it comes to making those choices, start with the application and the infrastructure requirements of that application and make sure your cloud matches. Um, for instance, I'm just going to take two public clouds and then I'm going to shut up. Um, AWS. AWS, honestly, is not designed from a services and infrastructure standpoint to run Exchange or oh, Oracle yeah. or any of these common stuff, right? Yep. VCHS is the exact opposite, quite frankly. It yeah. is designed <laughs> to run the very traditional stuff. And so based off of your workload is how you make your infrastructure choice, right? And that's the key thing no matter what and why, again, I think there'll be no one cloud mm. to rule them all. Right. You get so. the last word. All right, last <laughs> word. Um, just as a, a practitioner of, of the cloud arts, I guess, or the cloud dark arts, whatever you want to call it, um, I like to keep a job. So I, I like the integration stuff. I like creating uh, value with tying things in the Puppet and FCCM and, and the likes in the Windows world. Um, I like helping internal IT people keep their jobs, right? Help bring them along so that they can learn these things as well. Um, and I think going to, the, to what uh, Stephen and, and Stu are saying too is this is going to happen. If the app wants it, it's going to happen. 
in, in, in regards to like public cloud or containers or whatever. Um, if you want to keep a job, we have to embrace parts of it that make sense and learn how to, to offer it as a service. I think that's, that's just key if we want to be around, um, you know, post-cloud apocalypse or whatever. <laughs> but, and then just one final note, um, I'd like to really thank B Brown Bragg and B Underground, or v, VM Underground. This is awesome. I'd yep. love yeah. to see more of this. Yep. You're here. Um, unfiltered viewpoints from... Yes. From you know, everybody. From everybody. Yeah. From everybody. <laughs> yeah. yes. Even people that aren't experts, right? Yeah. So this is a big discussion. Awesome. Yep. Absolutely. So thank you. B Brown Bag. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. So I underground. Just thank, you. thank you, panel. BDI. See you at the party. <laughs> <laughs>